You're listening to Radio Maria, a Christian voice in your home. We're now presenting the show, Jesus of the Promise Messiah Judaism, with Roy Shulman. Hi, this is Roy Shulman, and welcome once again to Jesus, the Promise Messiah of Judaism, the show on Radio Maria that celebrates the Jewish roots of the Catholic Church, or seen the other way around, that celebrates the fulfillment, the full realization of all of the promise of Judaism in the Catholic Church and her sacraments. Well, if you are a long-time listener to, listener to the show, you know that I like little more than to have guests on who are other enthusiastic converts into the Catholic Church. Very often, I have the pleasure of welcoming a fellow Jew who's entered the Catholic Church. But today I have something perhaps even a little bit more unusual and every bit as exciting, which is I recently came to know a young woman who grew up Muslim, who is now an incredibly enthusiastic Catholic. And I invited her on to share her witness testimony. So without wasting any more time, I'm going to turn to that witness testimony. Now we did pre-record that call a few hours ago today. So what you'll be hearing is a recording of the interview that I held with her just a few hours ago and invited her to tell her witness testimony. So with that, let's go to that recording. We have today this great privilege of having another not Jewish entrant into the Catholic Church, but perhaps even um, more uh, uh, exceptional in some sense, a entrant in the Catholic Church from Islam. Are you there, Linda? Yes, I am. So why don't you introduce yourself? And when it's a Jewish convert, I usually say, what's a nice Jewish girl like you doing in a place like this? So I guess I could say, <laughs> you know, what's a nice Muslim girl like you doing oh. in a place like this? Okay, well, thank you so much for having me. So just to introduce myself, my name is Linda, and I was born in the United Arab Emirates to a Jordanian family. And uh, we were Muslim, but we were a practicing Islam Muslim family. So uh, my father did not believe in religion at all. Um, he spent a lot of his years in Europe. So he came back from Europe, a different man, did not believe in anything. My mom, um, I guess she would just maybe fast during Ramadan, but I didn't see prayers in the family. I didn't see any of that. But I've always uh, felt the need to be close to God. Um, when I was 16 years old, I had a dream where the city was burning in flames and it was very scary. It looked like hell. So that made me want to pray five times a day because I was really afraid of God and I didn't want to go to hell. So that was my main reason. I didn't want to go to hell. So I wanted to be close to God, to please him. I couldn't be really close to him because in Islam, there is no such thing as being close to God. You're always a slave and he's the master. And I didn't, want, I didn't want him to be angry with me. So I started to pray five times a day. And that lasted for a few years with me. Um, when I was 19, my father had cancer, passed away. We were in Jordan at that time because we moved from the UAE to Jordan when I was about 13. So um, he passed away and I started to see just the ugliness and the unfairness of Sharia law even though it wasn't heavily implemented in Jordan, but it's still there. And um, just didn't like it. I have always wanted to live in a Western country. Um, I grew up watching American movies, listening to American music. So I've always wanted to live in the West. So I remember one time I was uh, looking at the newspaper and I saw an ad about immigration to Canada. So I told my mom, why don't we just leave Jordan and just move somewhere? Let's move to Canada. And she thought it was a crazy idea because we didn't have anyone here. But she slowly started to entertain the thoughts. And we met with the immigration lawyer. We submitted our application and we got accepted. And uh, luckily, we had, uh, we had a friend who knew someone here. So she welcomed us here and she helped us settle down. So that happened when I was 21, when I came to Canada. So that was the beginning of a new chapter in our life. Um, 
I started to meet people from all these different religions and different faiths. Yes, I, we did have exposure to Christianity in the Middle East, but not so much. People didn't talk about their faith there. But now coming to Canada, it was in 2001, um, I was being challenged by co-workers and shortly after we came here, 9-11 um, happened and that really made me question it even more. So I had to question why is it that every time something terrible like that happens, it's always Muslim terrorists. So that uh, got me all curious and questioning Islam. Um, I started to want I wanted to understand Islam not from the Islamic point of view but from a historic point of view how did this religion come to be why did it come to be why did Muhammad wanted to establish this religion is it from God is it not from God so I was online reading and researching non-stop it was an obsession almost and I started to realize that Muhammad came up with this religion, it was not inspired by God, because throughout history, you see that um, divine truth was always being revealed to the Jewish people and then to Jesus, who was also a Jew. But why is it all of a sudden now the truth was handed down to Muhammad in Arabia, who had nothing to do with the Jewish people? And why was he obsessed with Jerusalem? It just didn't make sense to me. And the fact that he waged all these battles too, I did not like. I mean, why did he have to do that? Uh, I even compared him to Moses and Jesus and there was no comparison. I looked at Moses, I saw how he led his people out of Egypt, how they suffered, you know, wandering through the desert and ultimately to the promised land. And then Jesus being crucified. Now I did not believe he was God, but just the fact that his heroic death was something to admire. Meanwhile, Muhammad died surrounded by his many wives and he established an empire. So there was something very worldly about it. And um, another thing that I didn't like is that he looked down on Jews and Christians, even in the Quran, they're called like pigs and monkeys. And I couldn't understand how could God call his own creation these names? And uh, whenever they took over a country, they would always subjugate non-Muslims to these laws. They have to pay this tax or convert. So that to me was not fair. And I also came to understand that prior to Islam, people were not just worshiping idols. They were actually Christians and Jews in Arabia. And I found out that a lot of these Jewish tribes were slaughtered by Muhammad. And I, and I also found out there were these magnificent civilizations that existed. There was no need to, you know, make them Muslim because they already had civilizations. There were the Assyrians and the Phoenicians, uh, the Egyptians. Um, they, they were flourishing civilizations in the area. And suddenly they became Muslim. All of a sudden, they all had to convert. So I came to the conclusion that Muhammad was... Um, Sorry to say this, I don't want to offend anyone, but he was a warlord. So I had to, I had to leave. I couldn't be a hypocrite. This is not from God. And for me, I wanted God. I wanted to know the truth. And it's not the truth. Obviously, it's not the truth. So I had to walk away. And it was very difficult. I remember that night I cried myself to sleep. So I wanted to see what other religions are out there for me? What is the truth? So I started to look into, the first thing that came to mind was Christianity. So I remember I was reading the New Testament, did not make sense to me at all. For me, it was almost like mythology. You know, God became man, he was born of a virgin, died on a cross and he was resurrected. It just, for me, that was, I could not believe that. And, um, the fact that everybody is a sinner and how Jesus died for our sins also did not make sense to me because I didn't see myself a sinner. I thought I was a good person. So I went on to the next thing. I started to read on Buddhism and Hinduism. None of that appealed to me. I didn't, didn't make sense because I, I know that there is a God. There's one God out there. And um, that led me to Judaism. So I've always admired Judaism, but I, I, I realized also that I couldn't be a Jew. You have to be born into it. So I 
looked into Kabbalah, which was a trend in those days. So I went to their center um, here in Toronto, and I was assigned a teacher. We would speak with each other every week, and uh, but there was it was very superficial. There was no depth to it. There was no help. Um, during those times, I remember a friend of mine took me to a psychic. So uh, because I, we, we just did it for fun in the beginning, but I remember since having that meeting with a psychic, um, I felt the sadness creep into my life. She was a really good psychic. She told me everything about my life. And the funny thing is that she was very deceptive because she had holy water, she had a rosary, she prayed before she did the reading. So I thought it was, um, I felt at ease when I saw her. So I'm going to the psychic. I became addicted to seeing her because I thought she had the answers to, to my questions and she can help me. I started to see her on a monthly basis. And um, during that time also, like I said, I was exploring Kabbalah. And uh, because of the sadness that was creeping into my life, I was sharing those feelings with the Kabbalah teacher so he suggested that I buy the Zohar, which is the Old Testament written in Aramaic. And um, he said just having that book in my house will just spread joy and peace and I would not be sad. And I asked him about the price of the Zohar and he said it was going to be $700 and they had financing available. So as soon as he said that, I realized that this, is, this, this can't be from God. The truth cannot be sold with money. So I, I had an argument with him and I just cut off ties with the Kabbalah Center. It, it didn't last. It just lasted for a few months. I mean, because there was no substance to it. And I walked away and I realized that all religion is man-made. There's no such thing as religion. God may exist. He may, he may not exist. So I became this agnostic person with no faith, no belief in anything. Um, and I just spent my life like that for a few years, just being completely lost. I was in my twenties. I partied, I did stupid things. Um, I remember this one time when I got into a car accident and, um, it was late at night and, um, it was, it got me thinking about death all over again, because again, growing up, I was afraid of God and I was also afraid of death. Death was this mystery. And in Islam, death is absolutely horrific, the way it was explained to us, that when you're buried, these two creatures are going to come and they're going to question you about your faith and whether you understand who Muhammad is and the Quran. And if you fail to answer these questions, you're going to go to hell. So that was really scary. So after that car accident, uh, my life was spared, and it, but it got me thinking about death all over again. And um, I went to work the, a week after that accident, and I was just sharing what happened with one of my coworkers who was a born again Christian and she was on fire for Jesus. And she started to cry and she was telling me about Jesus and how he carried everything on the cross. And uh, I thought she was a little crazy, went back to my office, but something in my heart was gravitating towards that. Uh, there was something about what she said. There was power and conviction, and I was attracted to it. So I went to her again, and I asked her questions. I thought she might be able to help me. And we had fascinating discussions. And I remember I bought the Bible, uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament, and I started to read the Bible, starting from Genesis. And when I read Genesis, I was completely blown away because everything now was making sense from the creation, the story of Abraham, Joseph, Moses, everything, because these stories are mentioned in the Quran, but they're just scattered throughout the Quran and they, they weren't connected to one another. And um, in the Bible, it was all making sense to me. And um, I, I was just devouring it and I loved it. And she was explaining to me the power of the blood and why there was so much emphasis on the blood in the Bible and uh, the power of the blood of Jesus. And I was really, really fascinated by it. So that summer, that same year, I, I took a trip to Jordan to meet with my friends. And I thought that while I'm there, 
I'll just take a quick trip to Israel because I wanted to see all these places that I've been reading about, about in the Bible. And I went to Jerusalem by myself. I was a very adventurous person. And uh, I met um, a person while I was waiting um, at the borders uh, who was there on a pilgrimage. And he told me that uh, it wasn't safe for me to travel to Israel by myself and that I should join him on this trip. It was going to be a biblical, biblical tour. So I thought that was just wonderful. And we went to all these holy sites, all these beautiful churches, and it was absolutely amazing. So, um, but I, I wasn't touched by Jesus. Still, I was not touched by him. Um, I was sort of believing in his divinity in my mind, but it didn't really touch my heart yet. And uh, I believe because of visiting the psychic uh, also was influencing my decision to just accept Christ and follow him because there was demonic influence on my life. I uh, went back to Canada and I watched a movie called The Exorcism of Emily Rose. And that movie messed me up completely because since I watched that movie, I would wake up at three in the morning for every night. And that lasted for over a year. Uh, even though I watched that with my mom, nothing happened to my mom, but I was completely messed up. So I would, would wake up and I would wake up in fear and it was just getting worse and worse. Um, waking up at three in the morning, that was just uh, really, really weird. In the beginning, I thought it was just the influence of the movie, but no, it was more than that because I was having, starting to have bad dreams. So again, it was, it was all, I think, these demonic spirits that were unleashed because of that psychic lady. And uh, my sadness and depression was getting worse and worse. And um, instead of running to Jesus, whom I've been reading about, I was hearing these, I wasn't hearing voices, but there was this power that was just telling me not to do that and just to live my life. And uh, I was too young to give him my life. Just live your life, Linda. You're still young. And I, I listened to that voice and I did live my life, but it was disastrous. I got myself into bad friendships and bad relationships. I was having terrible thoughts. Um, my depression was getting worse and worse. We were having also problems in my family uh, with my younger brother. And I was so mad at God, I remember. I was so angry with him. And I told him, I remember one night I was telling him, God, I've been trying to find you and you're nowhere to be found and you're not showing me yourself. And look at the mess that I'm in and my whole family. I don't want to follow you. I don't even want to look for you anymore. You're just so, you're not a good God. You're just not good. And I cried myself to sleep that night. And um, after that, I met this lady who was this new age guru and I thought she was fascinating she's she knew all these famous people she used to be a model and um, she introduced me to this world of feng shui and positive energy and the pendulum and how to use the pendulum so I got into that but um, she told me that this thinking positive is going to help me it's all about me taking control of my thoughts and I just couldn't do that I couldn't, I was powerless. And you know, waking up at night at three in the morning was still going on. Um, and um, one night I just fell on my knees and I said, God, please show me who you are. I'm so sad and depressed. I'm having all these dark thoughts. Please show me who you are. Even if you end up being Allah of Islam, I'll follow you. Even though I despise that religion, just show me who you are. So two days after that prayer, a friend of mine found me on Facebook. We had grown up together in the United Arab Emirates and she had just become a believer in Christ. Um, she was Catholic, but she became a born again Christian. And she was telling me about Jesus and how he changed her life. And I thought she was crazy. And I told her to stop preaching to me. And I told her about the secret, the book, the secret that I've been reading and I've been um, you know, been trying to cure myself with positive energy. And she told me that the secret is the book of Satan. And when she said that, I thought she was completely nuts. For someone to even say the word Satan to me was stupid and silly. Nobody uses that language anymore. I thought I was smarter than her and more intelligent. 
Um, but she had uh, insisted on preaching the whole truth to me and evangelizing me. And she was very annoying, but she just kept at it. She would call me and email me and I would email her back with questions. I would mock her sometimes. But at the same time, I was just like that lady that I, that worked with me. I was really attracted to that. And I didn't know what it was, but there was something about this Jesus. But the fact that he was God and man at the same time just like, didn't, didn't make sense to me. So I was resisting it. And um, she, uh, one day she sent me a message. She sent me a Bible verse. It was from the Old Testament, Nahum 1.7. And it said, the Lord is good, safety in times of trouble. He cares for those that trust in him. When I read that, when I got that text message, I felt like my heart literally became a heart of flesh. I felt this heaviness left me, a lot of, a part of this heaviness left me, not all of it. And within one week, that message, that Bible verse appeared to me in two other ways. I was in my office. And I wanted to cheer myself up. So I, w I was online and I decided to just Google Bible verse of the day. And that Bible verse came up. And just a few days after that, I was in my room. And I, again, I'm trying to feel better about myself because I was so sad. I grabbed the Bible. I opened it. And sure enough, it was Nahum 1-7 that I read. And now I felt this. I felt something strange was going on. I felt like this power was after me. I felt somebody was chasing me and I didn't know who that person was. And I was resisting at the same time. Um, and still I'm waking up between the morning. I was having really bad dreams. I remember I used to dream about snakes uh, and these dogs barking at me. And my mom said that I had to go see a therapist that I can't ignore this any longer. And I went to see a therapist a few times and um, couldn't do anything to help me. Obviously nobody can help me. But our last visit, I, I went to see him three times. And that third visit, he told me, I cannot help you. You're fine. And I walked out of his office and I felt his presence was with me. It was, it's hard to describe, but there was, I felt like there was almost a man beside me. And it was a beautiful presence. Um, went back to my house and continued with my life and emailing my friend with my questions. And uh, again, being attacked by these dark thoughts to the point where I wanted to kill myself. I was having suicidal thoughts. Um, and my friend told me that I had to cry out to Jesus, that he loves me, that I have a father in heaven that really loves me. And I didn't want to hear it. I was resisting it. But that night, I woke up at three in the morning like I normally do. But when I woke up that night, there was this demonic presence in my room that I, that I can't describe. And I, it was as if this veil between me and the spiritual world was lifted up and I could see things now because I was, every time I just closed my eyes, I would see snakes. I saw a dragon. I saw this man with this horrific face and I saw demons basically. And it was really, really scary. And I really knew at that point that something bad was going to happen. I felt like some, something demonic was so close to me, it was about to enter me. And I heard a voice outside in the street at three in the morning crying. It was a man literally crying and saying, tell her to call me, please. I need her. Tell her to call me. And for some reason, I believed it was maybe God calling me to call on him. So I was in my bed and I said, God, please, I need your help. And I ask you this in the name of Jesus Christ. And the minute I said the name of Jesus, a hand appeared to me and that hand touched my feet. And then I just surrendered myself and I said, please put your hand on my head. And that hand touched my head. I cannot see anything but that hand. And then I told him to just touch me from my head to my feet. And then he, that hand touched me from my head all the way to my toes. And then I saw this light radiating from that hand and it became so bright and so intense. It became, it turned blue. And then I saw clouds and the clouds opened up and I saw this man in white 
with this beautiful wavy hair down to his shoulders and he looked like he was praying and he was the most beautiful man I've ever seen and when I saw him I said I knew I said it Jesus Christ and when I said that the clouds came and they covered him all over again and I felt like I came back into my body I didn't know what where I was to be honest I don't know whether it was a vision whether it was a out-of-body experience I don't know how to describe it but I came back to my body and I felt this peace that I've never felt my whole life and I just went to sleep I didn't question it I went to sleep but I woke up the next day and I felt something different I felt like I was not the same person anymore and I felt everything looked better around me the trees the clouds the sky everything looked better and I knew this was God Jesus Christ was God and I believed and I gave my life to him and I just told him you know you own my life now and I'm gonna follow you and that was it that was how I became a believer in Jesus and became a Christian that's, that's an incredibly beautiful story um, thank you um, you, you must realize now that what you were doing going from the, you know, psychic to the Kabbalah, uh, Kabbalah to the other New yes. Age leader was basically going from one demon to the next, trying to get freed from the last demon. Exactly. Yes. Yes. I know someone told me that I had many demons on me. Um, I, a couple of weeks ago, I read the... Uh, witness testimony of a shaman, you know, a witch doctor from the Amazon. The whole purpose, of the whole thing of shamanism is chanting to the spirits so that they become your friends and live inside of you, which means basically getting demonically possessed. And when he was getting more and more miserable and more and more depressed and more and more hateful, he kept thinking that the solution is to get an even more powerful spirit to, that will be able mm -hmm. to control these other spirits in me. And when you were giving that part of your witness testimony, I kept thinking of that, that it's like a, a, a trap of the devil that, that you start going down this whirlpool and where you look for help, he's going to suggest to you that where you should look for help is yet another demonic new age or occult yes. influence or whatever. Yes, and a lot of people are into new age these days and they don't realize the dangers of new age. Tell me something about what it felt like to see God as this, you know, kind of, you know, cruel, domineering, unsympathetic figure in um, Islam and, you know, in the, you know, at various stages in your journey, and then discovering how incredibly benevolent and uh, you know almost doting on you and affectionate and totally dedicated to your welfare he is can you say something about just like what a transformation that is to come into that yes. realization yes to be actually loved by God to have him to have him hear me when I talk to him that's that blew my mind because when I called on the name of Jesus he responded right away that he showed me himself. To me, I was in awe that the God that created the whole universe revealed himself to me, this insignificant, messed up girl. It's just really like that. What kind of love is that? That's just unbelievable, indescribable love. And he was aching he was... for you the whole time you were messed up, right? He was paying attention yeah. to you the whole time you weren't calling on him. He was still uh, heartbroken that you weren't turning to him. Yes, it's just unbelievable. And the God of Islam, obviously, he was, he, he's a master. He's, I'm sorry, he's hes a demon. I realized that this God, Allah, is not God. He is not God. He is a demon. And he wants to enslave his followers. And no matter how hard you pray, nobody can hear you. You just have to fast more, pray more, and it's never enough for him. He wants more and more more rituals, more duties. So I never approached God with love. It was all duties. And, and um, yes, uh, and out of fear, if I can um, presume to d disagree with you, I don't think that the Allah of Islam is a demon. I think it's Satan himself because oh. it is a monotheistic religion. Mm -hmm. And Satan, Satan 
doesn't really want you know, some demon under him to be worshipped as God. What he'd really like is to be worshipped as God himself. Yes, yes, that's, yeah, that's, I agree with you. <laughs> I didn't want to say Satan. I thought I would just say a demon, <laughs> but he is Satan. <laughs> there are lots, there are lots, you know, all of, all of, you know, the pagan religions that have many gods, those are demons, right? Because there are many, many demons. There are millions of demons. There are yeah. millions of, you know, Hindu gods and so forth. But when you have a malevolent monotheism, that gets very suspicious. Mm, you yes, know, that, that yes is I actually, agree. It's actually the big one himself. And, and, you know, Muslims are enslaved by fear. Like, they don't worship out of love. There are people who love God. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that, but the majority is. They, they worship God out of fear. They're, they're told to, right? I, I, my understanding is that if, um, if you were to tell a Muslim or suggest to a Muslim that Allah loves you and is yearning for your love, that would be viewed as a tremendous debasement of the dignity and the sovereignty of Allah that he should care about, you know, your loving him. Yes, because we're insulting. insignificant. Yes. yes. I, yeah. I mean, it, it would be lowering him to your, you know, to a kind of human level. He's far, you know, far bigger than that. Yes, exactly. And that's why I found it difficult to believe that God could become human. That was a very difficult concept, I think, for Muslims. And I also wanted to mention that, you know, Muslims want to escape hell by worshipping Allah so that they could go to paradise. But as a woman, paradise was not appealing to me. Cause it was, <laughs> I felt it was designed for men, but I thought it was better than hell, a better option than hell. This is, this is something I've always wondered about. I know what the reward is for men in paradise in Islam, but I could never find a reward for women in paradise. There is none. So I, sometimes I'd wonder, I guess we would be just serving the men, you know, serving them drinks and food. It's a very carnal paradise. It's but, all but they don't want, drinking and... they don't want you. They have their, their, uh, virgins. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know, but it's very sad. And, you know, paradise is, is not even holy in Islam. There's no holiness. Islam in general, there's the concept of holiness is not there. It's not like Christianity. I mean, when you read about the, 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 the saints and the mystics, wow, the level of holiness is just uh, unreal. You don't see that in Islam. You know, it's very carnal. Yes, there, there is unfortunately a, uh, a, basically a substitute for holiness, which is jihad, right? Which is violence to promote Islam. Yes, yes. And if you die while you're doing jihad, you, you're, you die a martyr and you're rewarded by these 77 virgins. Oh, oh is it? I thought it was 72. Uh, you know what? I'm not sure about that number. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's so sad that Muslims don't question these things. It, it's so sad. Uh, yeah, there's a beautiful uh, written account of a Muslim uh, woman from Pakistan who became Christian. And the title is, I Dared Call Him Father. And when mm -hmm. he, she heard from a Christian that Christians called God Father, she just couldn't let go of it. It was such it was such a um, entrancing idea of thinking of God as your father that she ended up, of course, calling out to him and, and being brought to faith. Yes, yes. You know, to this day, you know, just knowing that you have a father in heaven who loves you and cares for you and takes care of you and really cares about the details in our lives, there's, there's nothing... It's too good to be true. I mean, it's just... Yes. Really, that love is is unbelievable, unfathomable. You know, it's true. What you just said is is really profound because um, it is too good to be true. It's probably probably the most difficult thing to believe about Christianity is precisely what good news it is. I mean, it's it's that's probably the most unbelievable part aspect of Christianity more so than the virgin birth, more so than the resurrection, is that the God who created all existence itself, you know, knows about you personally, cares about you personally, is arranging the events of your life personally, cares about whether you love him personally, 
knows you by yeah. name. Yes. That yes. that is harder to believe than anything else about Christianity. Yeah, I agree. Yes, it's it's beautiful. I just get you know I look back at my life and I still can't believe that I was so blessed to be you know called to be his child and his daughter. It's what a privilege. I was just insignificant person, you know, and I now I've become a child of the creator of the universe. I mean, there's it, when when I think about that, I realize I can't be sad over anything happening in our lives, any um, difficulties or challenges. None of that matters because I've got someone in heaven who's my father. He'll take care of me, and that place heaven is our destination there's something to look forward to there's always hope there's something so much better to come yes but also also everything that does happen to us between birth and death is actually arranged by him for our own good and and so it's not only i i agree a thousand percent with everything you said but it's not only that it it doesn't matter because it's insignificant compared to what's awaiting us, which is true. But it's also that it can't actually be bad news. It's just good news that we don't recognize as good news, everything that happens to us. And I think you know from my witness testimony that that when I had my initial experience of God, I, I not only saw that everything that had happened to me had been the most perfect thing that could be arranged coming from an all-knowing, all-loving God, including those things that caused the most suffering, but it was especially those things that had caused the most suffering that had been the most perfect thing that could be arranged coming from him. Yes, definitely, yes. Yes, I mean, looking back at my life, you know, um, you know, father's, my father's death, uh, coming to Canada, all the difficulties that we've encountered, that was all, you know, God turned all that for, for a wonderful good, you know, yeah. becoming, becoming, part of his family. I would even say, uh, and this is perhaps a little bit controversial, but that your flirtation with occultism was turned to the good, because my suspicion is that although that's extremely unhealthy and a very unwise thing and, you know, no one should do it, um, I think it was probably made use of to bring about the supernatural experiences that brought you to Christ. Mm-hmm. Yes, definitely. Yes. So, it was I mean, unfortunate that I did that. I got into my, got myself into that mess, but like you said, it was for a greater glory, and God manifested mm -hmm. Himself in, in in a magnificent way. Yeah. If it weren't for all of that, this, who knows what would have happened? Well, if I understood your story correctly, your in a sense, almost your first exposure to Catholicism was that horrible psychic. Yes, yes, I'll get into Catholicism in a minute. <laughs> so talk about that a little bit. How did you end up um, recognizing the absolute, unique, complete truth of Catholicism? Um, so like I said, it took me many years. I was attending that church for eight years or so or nine years. Um, I had also explored orthodoxy, but I always felt like I, I have no place in or the orthodox church because it was all ethnic based. So you always feel like a stranger. Um, so I, that didn't last. So I, I stayed, attend, I, I was attending Protestant churches. It was one particular church. But the past two years, uh, two years ago, sorry, I was questioning authority out of nowhere. Authority and uh, Bible interpretation, because while we all agreed on um, on Jesus Christ, the triune God, all the basic beliefs we all agreed on, but other things such as baptism, infant baptism, uh, rapture, the Eucharist, uh, once saved, always saved, there was no agreement. Everybody was just it was interpreting the Bible their own way. And it was didn't make sense because the Holy Spirit should reveal the same truth to each and every one of us. So there's something missing there. And also the Eucharist, because Jesus said this is indeed his flesh and his blood. But why are we looking at it symbolically? And why do we do it once a month? Why not every week like the first Christians did? So I was pray asking God to show me the fullness of Christ. I want the fullness. And I also realized that I need 
to confess to someone. I didn't know it was the, the you know, it was this um, um, confession. I didn't wasn't very familiar with the sacrament, but I knew I had to go through confession. I felt it in my heart almost. I need to confess to someone. I want to have the Eucharist. I want to make sure that I'm in um, a state of grace. I, I didn't call it a state of grace in those days. I'd say I want to make sure that I'm good with God, that I have no blocks between me and him, no hindrances. So, you know, as I read more and, um, again, doing research, I'm, I have a curious mind. I was reading um, testimonies about Protestants who became Catholic, and to me that was to me that was horrific. I'm like, how could someone be Catholic? But I felt like a lot of the questions that I was asking were being answered in, their, in these testimonies. Um, and slowly, slowly, and again, very gently, God was pushing me to the Catholic Church. I was very fortunate that I did my RCA with the Oratorians of St. Philip Neri. Mm -hmm. Yes, you were they fortunate. Knew. They are a wonderful, yeah. wonderful. Uh, very educated. Yeah. They knew how to respond to all my objections. So I came into the Catholic Church last April. So I'm a new Catholic. And I keep discovering more beautiful things about the Catholic Church. There's the spirituality, the holiness. There's so much to learn. And uh, you said, uh, you mentioned the saints, and of course, there's nothing, nothing, nothing more valuable. I mean, look, if, if I want to, you know, learn how to, you know, cook, I'm going to try to find the best chef that I can find that has the best food, you know, and, and try to get them to teach me how to make a meal really good, you know. And, and the same thing, you know, fixing a car. You want somebody, you want the guy to be somebody who does it really, really, really well and knows all the ins and outs. And that's what we have in the Saints. I mean, I actually am not a big fan of reading spiritual books written by anyone except Saints, because if it's if you don't know they're a Saint, you don't know if the dish is going to come out right, right? Mm -hmm. But if they're mm -hmm. a Saint, then you know that they're on target, and you know that what they're saying is actually right and effective. And yes. um, I, I mean, you know, you could spend every day of the rest of your life reading books by saints and you wouldn't come to the end of them. Uh, for sure. I've always been drawn to, even as a Protestant, I found, for example, St. Uh, Teresa of Avila fascinating, St. Francis of Assisi, just the way they lived their life. They were radicals for Jesus and I wanted to be like them. They were right about everything except being Catholic, right? Like, how could they be Catholic? <laughs> <laughs> They're right about everything, everything else, but it's a shame they got this wrong. <laughs> yeah, you know, poor souls. <laughs> and also, as a Protestant, um, the imitation of Christ, the book, had a profound effect on my life. And I saw that there was a lot of um, talk about the Eucharist, how we should approach the Eucharist with fear and trembling and awe. So... That also got me thinking about the power of the Eucharist. Because all these saints were devoted to the Eucharist. They loved the Eucharist. They have something that I didn't have. And I had to have it. Sorry. Was this like a gradual, um, uh, a gradual unveiling of your eyes that God did bring you to the Catholic Church? It was gradual, but the past two years it was, uh, it was starting to... I felt I was very serious about my faith. Like I, it was like a matter of life and death. I want the fullness of the truth, God. I don't want to settle for second best. So, you know, uh, it just happened very quickly within a year and a half. But those saints and the imitation of Christ, there were seeds that were planted. And I think if it weren't for the people that I knew in my life that were former Catholics, it, I would have been Catholic much sooner. But they had nothing good to say about the Catholic faith and their experience there. So that also stopped me because they knew better, right? They're, they yeah. were in that church, so I listened to them. Yeah, they had the inside knowledge. God's been extremely gracious to you. He has shown you the fullness of the truth. He has brought you to the absolute deepest and fullest and truest meaning of life possible for this period between birth and death and the best possible eternity actually um so do you try to 
share the wealth with others? Do you evangelize? How do you evangelize? How do you feel about about others who are not have not yet received the gift that you've received? Um, yes, for, I mean yes, for sure. Especially with my friends, I see my friends who are into yoga who are just not giving their lives to Christ. Or a lot of my friends, they think they're Christians, but they really aren't. They're not really followers of Christ. They're not giving their whole lives to Him. They're like living the world, and they say they're Christians. So I try to focus on my friends, my family. Um, just whenever I I meet someone and we talk about life and the meaning of life, I have to mention Jesus. I mean, I have to. I can't keep quiet. I mean, He saved me from destruction, and He can do the same thing for others. But unfortunately, people resist him. I don't know why. I don't know. It's just uh, it's the devil in well, this it, world. I, I think. I think it is. I think that. I think that um, there's, in some sense, there's always somebody whispering in your ear, um, you, you know, trying to lead you astray, and the whispering becomes particularly loud in two circumstances, I believe. One is when there is a threat of Christ coming through. In other words, when somebody is trying to, you know, kind of draw you to Christ, then there's a barrage of, you know, rationalizations and objections and even sometimes irrational anger that the devil stir or the demons stir up in you just to get you out of that dangerous situation. Dangerous, of course, from their point of view. The other time I think they're extremely... Um, loud in your ear is when you're trying to evangelize. You know, it's very, very easy to, I find, to have an opportunity to share the faith with somebody, and just as you're about to do it, you have the thought, oh, no, 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 but I'm going to really offend them and drive them away, mm -hmm. or no, it's, it's going to be rude and invasive, and I should leave them alone, and so forth. So, I mean, there's always whispering in your ear to kind of draw you into temptation and so forth. Um, but it's, it's particularly almost violent when it's around evangelization, either being evangelized or evangelizing others, because that's really what the war is all about. I mean, the war between God and the devil is over human souls and over whether human souls turn to God or get mired in the deceits of the enemy. And so, you know, you're really at the front lines of that battle when you are either evangelizing or being evangelized. 100% and I and sometimes I yeah for sure I hear that voice a lot you know you know it's not nice you're not being put you're not being um, we have to be politically correct these days but you know as if we're gonna be soldiers of Christ we really have to overcome these fears and be encouraged and and speak the truth we have to it's our it's our duty Good. What was your what was your experience of or exposure to Christianity in the UAE or in Jordan? Was that did, did Christians have to keep a very low profile? Were they were they free yeah. to practice? Were they free so, to God forbid evangelize? What was what was it like in that world? Well, in the UAE, my exposure to Christianity was through our Filipino nanny at home. <laughs> she was very devout, and she actually took me to church with her one time. It was Christmas mass. And I went with her and I loved every moment. I think that day I was nine years old and I remember it was the happiest day of my life. Wow. And I did something I wasn't supposed to do. I don't know, she encouraged me to take communion and I did take communion. I didn't know any better. I had I had the Eucharist as a nine-year-old Muslim girl. <laughs> but it was a beautiful day and I was, you know, I was filled with joy that particular day. That was my exposure to Christianity. Okay. Um, is there anything that you want to share with our audience to try to to try to uh, ignite the same fire in them? Um, yeah, I would say to you know to to be bold about our faith in Jesus and to, to proclaim Him everywhere we go and not to be afraid. And He is the only way to the Father. There is no other way. Christ is everything. He's God. He's I don't know. Like honestly, like. We have to have hearts on fire for him. We have to. We can't be lukewarm about our faith. That's the dangerous part. Like in my journey, when I look back, the moments when I was lukewarm are the, the worst moments in my Christian uh, journey, in my walk with God. We have to be on fire, and we have to talk about Jesus. And to Protestants, I would say, 
to open your mind, to read the history of the church and, and not be afraid. And um, you'd be surprised where God could lead you. And we should just follow Christ wherever he leads us. Because, you know, back in those days when I was searching, I told God that I would follow him wherever he would take me and I will not question it and I will just obey him even if it didn't make, it didn't make sense to me. Like the Catholic Church did not make sense to me, but I obeyed and I followed him and he, he took me to the fullness of the faith. And I'm forever grateful and thankful for that. Amen. So with that, I guess I, all that's left to do is to thank you very much for sharing your story with our audience. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Well, I pray that people will be touched by the story. Well, I, I'm sure they will be. So again, just uh, thank you very much. Well, you've been listening to a uh, interview I did a few hours ago today over the telephone with a young Muslim woman, Linda, who has now a incredibly enthusiastic entrance into the Catholic Church. You've been listening to Jesus the Promised Messiah of Judaism on Radio Maria with your host, me, Roy Shoman. And um, I hope you've enjoyed this wonderful, wonderful, wonderful witness testimony. I know that I have. And we have unfortunately come to the end of our time for today. Uh, if you wish to hear this testimony again, it will be up on, um, on my podcast, uh, which is, I think it's called Roy Showman Podcast. And it'll also be up on my website, www.salvationisfromthejews.com. And if you want to listen to more of this sort of show, tune in again next week, same time, same place for Jesus, the promised Messiah of Judaism on Radio Maria. And since we've come to the end of our time together today, I will say goodbye for now. Please join us again next week, same time, same place. Goodbye for now.